Hello 3D printing friends, today on the BV3D channel we'll take a look at the AnchorMake M5 3D printer. I'm Brian and you are watching BV3D. Hi, welcome back. Okay, so today we're going to take a look at the AnchorMake M5 3D printer. I'd like to thank AnchorMake for sending this over free of charge so I could show it to you. First, let's dig into the specs. The AnchorMake M5's build volume is 235 millimeters on the X and Y axes and 250 millimeters on the Z axis. There are dual Z axis stepper motors built into the left and right sides of the gantry. It has a 4.3 inch color touchscreen in a pod on the right side of the X axis. This pod also contains the camera, which allows real-time monitoring of the print in 720p, and it can record time-lapse videos in 1080p. The printer also uses that camera for an AI-based print failure detection system, which can spot issues like the first layer not sticking to the bed and spaghetti-type print failures. On the left side of the X-axis is a smaller pod containing the filament runout sensor, the filament guide tube to get the filament to the tool head, and the tool head's power and data cable. And it has an animated LED indicator to show you the printer's status. The tool head has a direct drive extruder with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle and dual parts cooling blowers. It takes 1.75 millimeter filament, and that filament can be PLA, PETG, ABS, or flexible TPU. The nozzle goes to 260 degrees Celsius, and the bed goes to 100 degrees Celsius. On the bed is a magnetic sheet, topped with a double-sided, textured PEI flex plate to make it easy to remove your prints. It also has automatic mesh bed leveling that uses the nozzle itself to probe a 49-point grid to map out the high and low spots on the print bed. And it's got a power loss recovery feature that lets it resume a print after a power outage. It comes with a printed quick start guide and a toolkit with flush cutters, an open-ended 8 and 10 millimeter wrench, various hex drivers, an acupuncture needle for a traditional treatment of nozzle clogs, a spare nozzle, and a spare length of PTFE tubing, all in a nice looking case. The printer comes very well packed and the foam padding serves an additional useful purpose when assembling the printer. It supports the X and Z gantry while it's being bolted to the base. Assembling the printer is just bolting the gantry to the base, plugging in the two Z-axis motors, and plugging in two USB Type-C cables. And all that happens behind a removable cover on the base, so when you're done, the cover snaps back into place and everything is neat and tidy. During assembly, you can choose whether you want to mount the spool holder at the top of the printer or down low on the side. The printer has Wi-Fi connectivity. This allows you to use the AnchorMake slicer to slice files and send them to the printer, and also allows you to use the AnchorMake mobile app to start, stop, and monitor print jobs. Note that in order to use the mobile app and to send print jobs wirelessly from the slicer, the printer, mobile app, and the computer running the slicer need an internet connection. The printer is mostly usable without the mobile app, and by that I mean there are some settings on the printer that you can only adjust from the app. But you can slice and save files to a USB-C flash drive, plug the flash drive into the printer, and print from that. In the AnchorMake Slicer software, there's normal mode and fast mode settings. Normal mode has speeds up to 250 millimeters per second and acceleration up to 2500 millimeters per second squared. Fast mode has speeds up to 500 millimeters per second and acceleration up to 5000 millimeters per second squared. And you're not limited to using the AnchorMake slicer. Anchor has setup instructions for using Prusa Slicer or Cura to slice files for the printer. The AnchorMake slicer is the recommended slicer to use with the M5, and since it's basically part of the package, we're going to talk about it here. Now, I've been using the AnchorMake slicer to slice and send files to the printer, and although it's got a few quirks, it does what it's supposed to do without a lot of fuss. It follows the user interface trend of being in dark mode, but that's all it knows, and you can't make it not do that. It also doesn't have any keyboard shortcuts, so no hotkeys to open files, for example. It's all clicking on buttons and menus. It also doesn't understand the concept of new project, which in pretty much any other slicer will clear the build plate and reset the settings. You'll need to delete the models and reset the settings yourself, or you can just quit the slicer and open it up again. 
For setting printing parameters, it's got easy mode and expert mode. Easy mode lets you specify the type of material with presets for PLA+, PETG, ABS, and TPU. You can also select between normal and fast speeds, pick a layer height, pick an infill percentage, and choose whether supports are on or off. It's basic stuff, but at the same time it makes it easy if you're just starting out with 3D printing. If you thought, just from looking at this user interface, that it was Cura behind the scenes, switching to expert mode will confirm it. The usual Cura settings categories are here, so if you know your way around Cura, you should have no trouble. In the general settings, you'll want to make sure that Create AI File When Slicing is on. And probably also make sure the Auto Check for Updates is on so the slicer can let you know if there's a newer version available. You can also edit machine and material settings and customize printing parameters. To slice a model, click the folder icon to get the Open File dialog box, select a file, and it lands on the build plate. I'll slice Luby's Aria the Dragon for PLA Plus in easy mode at normal speed with 0.2mm layer height and 10% infill. These are the standard settings. It says it'll take an hour and 18 minutes to print, and the actual print time turned out to be an hour and 20 minutes, so the slicer's time estimates are pretty accurate. We'll take a look at some prints in a couple of minutes. I had the opportunity to test some of the printer's features, such as filament runout detection, power loss recovery, and the AI print failure detection. So here's how it went. Filament runout detection worked. I cut the filament where it enters the machine while I was printing an XYZ cube. The printer beeped to alert me, and I was able to load more filament and resume the print. And here's the result. It came out pretty good, I think. But the sensor is quite far from the extruder. You can't retract the filament out of the system, so you have to purge the filament through before you can load more, which gets the new filament into the extruder's drive gears and coming out of the nozzle. Still, the fact remains that the runout sensor worked and it let me know I needed to run out and get more. Next, I tested the power loss recovery feature, and this too worked as it should. While printing an XYZ cube, I turned off power to the printer, waited a few seconds, and then turned it on again. When the printer rebooted, it detected that it had lost power during the print and offered to let me resume. I chose to do so, and the printer got itself back up to temperature and resumed the print. Here's the result, and I think it came out pretty okay. One thing to keep in mind, though, when this textured PEI-coated sheet cools down, sometimes the prints release on their own. So if the power has been off too long, you might not be able to resume the print if the print is no longer stuck to the bed. After the power loss recovery test, I wanted to test the AI print failure detection. Interestingly, the default state of the feature on the printer itself is off, and it appears the only way to turn the feature on is by using the mobile app. The printer screen will show you whether the feature is on or off, but it won't let you change it. Another requirement for this feature to work is the slicer has to create a file for the AI component of the printer while it's slicing. Now, fortunately, in the slicer, this feature is on by default. So, the first time that I tested was by accident. I was printing a MacGyver Caladragon, and in the final minutes of the print, it came loose from the bed. Unfortunately, because the AI feature was off, it didn't catch it, and so now I have a dragon which, like me, could probably use a haircut. Later, after I used the mobile app to turn the AI feature in the printer on, I designed a model specifically to test a print failure. Yes, with this model, failure is not an option. It's a standard feature. <laughs> this is a table-shaped model with a really wide horizontal overhang, and I deliberately printed it without support so it would be spaghetti-like in its failure. And the AI did eventually see the spaghetti monster that had formed but it took 17 minutes of pure pasta printing production prior to perception. I think the reason it took so long is that those big, flat, unsupported layers on the model took a while to print, and the AI feature, from what I've been told, kind of averages the five most recent layers before it decides if there's a problem. So if the failure happens within the last few layers of a print, you're probably not going to get notified of it. I think the intent of the feature is to alert you to a catastrophic failure mid-print, so you have the opportunity to look at the printer's camera or look at the printer in person and determine if you want to keep going or if you want to stop so you don't waste a bunch of filament. 
Oh, I also got the opportunity to test the over-the-air firmware update feature. The printer lit up a small red indicator on the screen, and tapping it took me into the settings page, where the firmware button also had a red dot. So I tapped the firmware button, and then the check for update button, which showed me the currently available firmware and let me install it. The printer downloaded the update, installed it, and then rebooted. And the whole process only took about two minutes and worked as expected. Now, let's get into the prints. All of these were sliced with AnchorMake Slicer, and apart from two of them, I used Easy Mode, Normal Speed, 0.2mm layers, and 10% infill. The first is a McGuybeer Caladragon, which printed in just under 23 minutes. I used the small spool of white filament that came with the printer for this one. It printed well. There's a little bit of wispy stringing between the antlers and between the tip of the tail and the body, but it's a good print with a good surface finish. The backs of the antlers are good, which I usually attribute to good parts cooling. I also printed a Calicat in the white filament, and it took just 21 minutes to print. As with the Caladragon, a little bit of wispy stringing. The 45 degree overhang of the tail printed without issue, which again indicates good airflow from the dual parts cooling blowers. Next up is a 3D Benchy. This one printed in 45 minutes, and the M5 seems to have done a good job with it. I don't really see any stringing, and the surface finish is good. I also printed Luby 3D's Aria the Dragon in just an hour and 20 minutes. There's more of that wispy stringing we've been seeing, but for the most part, the print came out okay. This red matte PLA almost seems to highlight where the slicer put the Z seam, and that's where each layer starts and ends, and the slicer seems to be trying to keep them aligned near the backs of the models. Here you can see an issue on this back leg, and then up along the back edge of this wing. Overall though, it's still a pretty good print. Now I wanted to see how this red filament would do on a model that I'd already printed in Anchor Makes White Filament, so I reprinted the Calicat. It did pretty well, but like on Aria the Dragon, you can clearly see where the slicer was placing the Z seam on the tail. But the sides came out good, so I think the print settings might need to be tweaked a tiny little bit to better hide that seam. Then, I figured as long as I had the red filament loaded, I would print something that's supposed to be red. So here's Eastman's Deadpool bust. This printed in just 8 hours and 12 minutes. This model is designed to print without supports, and I think the printer did a good job on it. There are a couple of places where the speed of the printer affects the quality of the overhangs, where the overhangs are pretty flat. Places like the bottoms of the arms and the undersides of some of Deadpool's belts and gear around back. I didn't really see any stringing on it, and I'm happy with how it came out. Then I wanted to see how the printer would do with the model sliced at the fast speed setting. Here's the result, and this time it only took five and a half hours. Five and a half hours! The problem areas from the normal speed are still there, and they look a little bit worse. The surface finish seems to have taken a bit of a hit with the added speed. It's not quite as smooth as it looked at normal speed. Given that, I think the fast speed setting might be best suited for prototyping parts when you want a rough idea of what a thing is going to look like in the shortest amount of time, or if you want to do a quick test fit of something. It could also be okay if you're going to finish the model by smoothing, sanding, and painting it. But if you want something that looks better without having to mess with it, stick with the normal speed setting. Going further into the danger zone of high speed, AnchorMake's mobile app has a few pre-sliced models, and one of these is a super fast Benchy. So I printed that directly from the app, and this is the result. I refer to it as a BSO, a Benchy-shaped object. The result with the red filament is not going to win any awards in the appearance department. That said, the fact that the AnchorMake M5 did print a recognizable Benchy in just 17 minutes is pretty impressive. Now, I also wanted to print a couple of things in spiral vase mode, which meant that in the slicer, I had to switch from easy mode to expert mode and turn on spiralize outer contour. Here's my desktop trash can, printed in an hour and 31 minutes. I set the extrusion width on this to 0.8 millimeters as well to get a strong outer wall on it. It came out really good, and yes, it's got decent strength as well. The faceting you see on the surface of the print has to do with Tinkercad. It approximates curved surfaces by using lots of flat surfaces. 
For example, a cylinder is actually a 64-sided polygonal prism. While slicing in spiral vase mode, I sliced the rocket plane model and scaled it up to the full 250mm build height. And I swapped the filament for some protopasta nebula stardust. It seemed appropriate. This printed in an hour and 45 minutes and it came out great. The color transitions on the filament and the over-the-top glitter content look amazing. Where I do see a problem is at the top of the model, where I think the slicer needed to slow things down a bit to get a little bit more cooling. It looks like it wasn't letting the previous layer cool down enough before putting the next layer on top of it. But that's about the only bad thing I see on it. The last print is another Caladragon, but this time I'm back to easy mode, not using spiral vase mode, and... I'm printing in flexible TPU. This only took 20 minutes to print. This is a little bit faster than the first Caladragon that took 23 minutes because I set the infill on this one to 0%. Doing that makes the model easier to squish because it doesn't have anything inside. You can see that there's a bit of stringing between the antlers, but the surface finish is smooth. And the model can indeed be squished. So those were the prints. Now let's get into what I like and don't like about the printer, starting with the things I like in no particular order. With just one cable from the x-axis to the tool head and the filament guide tube, there's no cable mess. It's fast. It prints about three times as fast on average as an Ender 3 Pro when using the normal speed mode in the slicer. And slicing with fast speed, it prints almost five times as fast. The printer can be Wi-Fi connected. But if you don't want to use Wi-Fi printing, you can export files from the slicer to a USB flash drive, plug that into the printer, and print that way. So you have the flexibility to use it without putting it on your network. I did, though, so using the mobile app, I get notifications on my phone and my watch when something needs attention. It'll tell me when a print is done, or it'll let me know if it's run out of filament, or if it's made spaghetti for dinner. I can also monitor the printer's camera in the mobile app or in the desktop slicer. I like the LED animation on the left side of the x-axis arm that shows the printer status. And the power loss recovery, filament runout sensor, and AI print failure detection features work as expected. Now here's what I don't like about the AnchorMake M5. Some of the printer settings are only settable from the mobile app and not from the screen. The screen is easily readable from the left side, but not so much from the right side. When seen from the right, the colors can be washed out or go inverted. The fans in the printer's base are pretty loud, and they're on full time. It would be nice if the printer could turn those off when it wasn't busy printing. You can print from a USB flash drive, but it needs to be a USB-C flash drive, or you need to use a USB-C to USB-A adapter. Also, the motors are kind of loud when the printer's homing the Z-axis. So now I have a few suggestions for AnchorMake. The AI print failure detection feature? Make it so that can be turned on or off from the printer's settings screen instead of just showing that it's on or off. Add a slow speed to the slicer settings. There may be times when a person wants to slow things down to get a super shiny finish with a silk filament or for any other reason. It would be nice to have a preset for that without having to drop into expert mode and tweak the settings in there. Add keyboard shortcuts to the slicer for commonly used commands and add the ability to make a new project, clearing out the existing models and going back to standard settings. While the filament runout sensor works, it would be nice if the firmware knew that it needed to purge out like 500 millimeters of filament and just offer to do that for you to clear the guide tube and get ready for the new filament. And I think that's it. Those things aren't critical, but they would make life with the printer a little easier. So that's the AnchorMake M5. It's been pretty easy to use, and it's done pretty well with the models I've printed on it. It definitely made quick work of the print jobs I sent to it, with normal speed being on average about three times as fast as something like an Ender 3 Pro, and fast speed getting dangerously close to five times as fast. The slicer is still a work in progress, I think. It lacks a few conveniences, but it does the job. Thanks again to AnchorMake for sending the M5 over for review. If you're interested in it, there are links in the description. And big thanks to everyone who supports the channel. If you liked this episode, give it a thumbs up and maybe consider subscribing so you don't miss future episodes. Well, 3D printing friends, that's about all the time we have for this one. And now that we're at the end, let's go print something fast. And cool. Oh, I also got the opportunity to test the over-the-air filament update feature. 
Filament update feature? Firmware update feature. How do you update filament? <laughs>